Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for this installment of UCLA Health webinar. I hope to answer multiple questions about male fertility at the end of this seminar. My name is Dr. Jesse Nelson Mills. I'm Associate Clinical Professor of Urology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA with a special interest in andrology, sexual dysfunction, and male fertility. A little housekeeping before we start this webinar, please, at the end of this time, half hour or so talk, uh, direct questions to Twitter. So get on the Twitterverse, hashtag UCLAMDChat is where you need to go to forward your questions to me at the end of this webinar. People that know me are probably wondering why I'm wearing this disheveled, rakish beard, and it's, uh, it's for no other reason other than this is Movember, which every year is a men's health movement dedicated to forwarding men's health, and that's everything from prostate cancer screening to psychiatric health to overall well-being. And this is a global effort, but certainly UCLA is taking this uh, on a, our own campaign. So if you're interested in contributing and looking at some of these uh, mustachioed pictures of me here within the next week, I, I will adopt one of those. Please uh, contribute to the UCLA Movember website uh, on behalf of Men's Health and the Movember Foundation. So today we're going to talk about male subfertility, and I called it subfertility mainly because in this day and age, there are very few men that were not able to help somehow and not look at this as a condition of infertility, but really how can we optimize men's health, men's sperm production, and men's fertility options to really provide a wealth of services to couples that are struggling with, with fertility issues. And so to that end, we're going to break this down into a few different categories. We're going to provide some background information on subfertility, a little bit of history about this, and then we're going to get into some case presentations, things that illustrate some of the points that we're going to learn about during this webinar. And lastly, the big reveal, I'll be telling people how to improve their fertility with non-prescription methods. So in other words, how can you stay out of my office or what can you do before you get to my office so that we can help your fertility goals uh, be achieved. So a background on male fertility is, is, is kind of interesting. Obviously since the time of creation, uh, there have been a lot of philosophers that have thought about what is the origins of male fertility. Some early thoughts were that that the, we knew that semen was responsible for procreation. Early thoughts were going back to the fact that maybe, maybe there are these little men that would run out through the male ejaculatory system and become fully developed babies in utero so that the female part of this was really just a holding ground for that male which was fully developed within the male reproductive tract to mature. So again, a very uh, male-centric thought about fertility and therefore lack of fertility. It was Aristotle actually that came up with the thoughts behind gender selection in fertility. So his thought was that if a man was thinking about himself during the point of climax, then the child would be a boy. If the man was thinking about his partner at the time of climax, the subsequent child would be a girl. And as the father of two sons, uh, everybody can pity my wife at this point. But either way, that was yet another early thought about the origins of, of fertility and gender selection. Now, it wasn't until the 1700s that the father of, of microscopy, an, a Dutch tradesman, Antony van Leeuwenhoek, was the first person to actually see sperm under a microscope, presumably discovered on a long weekend when Mrs. van Leeuwenhoek was at her mother-in-law's house. And here is the microscope that he initially used, and here, of course, are the sperm that he found under that microscope to really forward the science at that point. So in order to classify male subfertility, I look at it in two categories. How bad is it? And there's a couple of ways to look at it. There's oligospermia, in which a man has not enough sperm, or there's azospermia, where, I'm going to get through this here in a sec, where there's azospermia, where there is no sperm at all. And oligospermia is further categorized into a few different subcategories. So there's teratospermia, where the sperm are uh, poorly shaped. 
there's asthenospermia, where the, the sperm just aren't moving as well as they should. We call that a motility defect. And then lastly, this is a Scrabble word you'll probably never use, but there's oligoteratosthenospermia, which took me seven years to learn how to pronounce, and essentially means all of the above. In azospermia, of course, there is absolutely either no production of sperm or there's no sperm in the ejaculate. So for a little background on the semen analysis, we look at four main components. The first metric we look at is the volume, how much semen comes out when a man ejaculates. That's critical to looking at the various causes of fertility, either a blockage or a, a production problem. We then look at the concentration, which is essentially a function of how many sperm per milliliter of ejaculate volume a man makes. Motility, as we talked about in the previous slide, is essentially how fast they move, and that's subcategorized into a few different degrees of motility. Zero is essentially a sperm that isn't moving at all, that's it's outlived its or it's dead, outlived its lifespan. One is when they're, they're, they're twitching, but not necessarily moving relatively directionally. Two is a slow progression, and three is fast progression, so the rapidly modal sperm. Those are presumably the ones that'll have the best chances of traversing the cervix to find, uh, find an egg. Morphology is characterized as a percentage of normal sperm. So again, it's, it's a ratio, essentially, of how many normal sperm per ejaculate a man produces. And believe it or not, it's a very low number to be normal. So a number of patients come to me very concerned when they're told that their morphology is only 2%. And they're afraid that that means that 98% of their sperm is not shaped correctly, and they have severe fertility impairment. But when I tell them that 96% misshapen sperm is considered normal, it alleviates some pressure and allows us to, to move forward to see how much more we can optimize to get that extra 2%. So two main categories of male fertility, non-obstructive, meaning that there's no production going on in this testicle, or obstructive, meaning that the factory is there, but the highway is closed. And so in both of these, you have a problem with amount of sperm in the, in the ejaculate. And the ejaculatory system really starts in the testicle, and so that's uh, dealing with the obstructive side. A sperm is made in the testicle. It then finds its way in through a, a series of a few ducts into the epididymis, which is the sperm holding gland, which eventually uncoils into the vas deferens and then out into the urethra and the ejaculatory duct. And so anywhere along that system, there could be a blockage. So what can go wrong? What are the different common things we see in male subfertility? So I look at the non-obstructive side as the five H's. It's easy to remember, and we can subcategorize it from that point as well. So heat, health, hormones, heredity, and the last one's a little bit of a stretch, huge and hurt. And so in that, anabolic steroids, the huge part, and hurt uh, narcotics. So men with anabolic steroid use and narcotics will have a significant uh, disruption in their normal sperm production. We'll get into that in, in a couple of slides here. Now on the obstructive side, we previously discussed a little bit. Essentially it's where for some reason there's a blockage somewhere along the highway there. So what about heat? The reason that we uh, as men have scrotums is essentially to keep the testicles outside of the abdomen to keep it, the, the sperm about two degrees colder than the rest of the body. So if you have any sort of heat source on those testicles, it can be a very common source of, of male subfertility. And one of the most common sources of heat is something called a varicocele, which is something I see very frequently in my practice as a male fertility specialist. Approximately 40% of the men that come to my office with fertility problems have varicoceles. And essentially, all a varicose seal is, is varicose veins that are enlarged because the system of transport of that blood from the testicle back up into the heart is too stretched out. It's dilated, and the, the valves that normally work to push that blood away from the testicle are too far stretched apart, and the blood tends to pool against gravity. So I always say if a man was able to walk on his hands for the entire day, he wouldn't have a varicose seal, and those, the sperm would be colder. Now obviously that's impractical, but that's essentially a good way to look at this, is gravity 
plus the varicocele is what causes the, the extra heat on that testicle. There are probably some other factors that varicoceles emit that we're not entirely sure of, but uh, for the most part, think of a varicocele as a heat, a source of heat that goes uh, directly to the testicle and causes the sperm not to work so well. Now, there are other things that can cause heat as well. Hot scrotal temperatures can come from uh, obesity. Just imagine the scrotum sitting between two very large thighs, then the body temperature of, that, of those thighs are actually going to cause difficulties with heat. Sedentary lifestyle, same thing. If you're sitting down all the time and you're not moving around, testicles, they're going to be a little bit hotter than they should be. So what about boxers versus briefs? I get that all the time. If we remember back to the presidential elections of uh, over 20 years ago, we learned about Bill Clinton's boxers versus briefs habits, and, uh, and it's, since that, it's always been a topic of conversation. Now, really, there's been a lot of literature, and it seems as if there's a very, very weak correlation between a man's underwear choice. Having said that, a lot of men, that's the first thing they do before they come see me, is uh, proudly tell me that they've gone commando in hopes of improving their sperm counts. So it's, a, it's certainly a, a, a fun topic of discussion, but maybe not clinically useful. So what about overall health? So whatever's good for the man is good for the sperm. So conversely, whatever's bad for the man is also bad for the sperm. So cigarette smoking, bad for sperm, bad for man. Alcohol consumption, in moderation, probably not bad for sperm. In excess, greater than five to six drinks at one setting, especially highly correlated with poor sperm quality. What about obesity itself? Talked about it in the heat section. Interestingly enough, obesity also has problems with hormones. So men that have very large body mass indices will also have abnormalities in their testosterone production as well as their, their conversion of testosterone to estradiol, which is the, the female hormone and can have some negative effects on sperm production as well. So obesity really a multi-hit problem with sperm production as well as we know overall health. Hypertension as well associated with, with male subfertility. Some of that hypertension medications also can have a negative effect. So something to discuss with your physician if you are attempting to have a child and, and unsuccessful and something you can bring up with your male fertility specialist as well to perhaps look for an alternative medication or figure out other ways to control blood pressure, diet, exercise, all the other good stuff we hear about. So on the hormone side of non-obstructive subfertility, Men are not as simple as testosterone alone, although that's what we are sort of known for and, and given credit for. There are actually a lot of hormones that can be responsible for, for problems with fertility. They most start in the pituitary gland. So there is a, a sperm-producing hormone called FSH. It's actually named for uh, the female hormone, which is follicle-stimulating hormone. Turns out it has a similar function in the pituitary gland of men and essentially works as a regula regulatory hormone for production of sperm. So if a guy is making normal sperm numbers, his FSH should actually be pretty low. If a guy is making no sperm, then his FSH is going to be elevated. It's going to be high because his pituitary gland is telling his testicle, look, you need to crank up the factory production here, and you're not. You're not, you're not meeting the goals. And the only way that our body has to, to tell the testicle to do that is through that FSH hormone. So it's a very important indicator for me to determine where the problem is. There's really no great number. I threw out 12 uh, milli international units per milliliter as the upper limit of what I would consider normal. However, a lot of different considerations go into that number. So I can get concerned about FSHs as low as six, uh, but certainly over 12, I start to be a lot more concerned that we have a primary testicular problem. So testosterone itself, we talked about, we'll talk about it throughout this lecture. It turns out that testosterone is critical for sperm development in the testicle. And so this is where a common mistake is made both on a patient as well as multiple physician uh, side of things in understanding how to treat male subfertility. Because if you believe what I just said, that testosterone is important for normal sperm production, and a man comes to your office with low testosterone, then you would think the most natural thing to do would be to put them on testosterone replacement therapy. Unfortunately, it has exactly the wrong effect, and we'll talk about that in one of our case presentations coming up. So prolactin, another interesting hormone from the pituitary gland, 
that if it is elevated, it can actually shut down the whole system. So prolactin elevation usually affects the other hormones in the pituitary gland, again, that FSH hormone, to essentially stop production. So the problem is not down in the testicle. The sperm machinery is there, but there's a problem up here in terms of sending the proper signals down to the testicle. So prolactin elevations often can be treated with medication. Sometimes, if there's a prolactin secreting tumor involved in the elevated prolactin, a patient may even need uh, surgery to remove that tumor. So again, another common hormone I will draw on my men with potential subfertility. And then finally, estradiol, we touched on that a little bit earlier when we were talking about obesity. Essentially, uh, higher estradiol levels feed back on the pituitary gland to shut down those pituitary hormones, much like testosterone does, but to the point where then sperm production may be affected by that, that pituitary shutdown. So one of the treatments that I offer to patients is if their estradiol levels are too high for me, if I put them on a medication to lower those levels and drive the equation back to higher testosterone levels, then we may be able to improve their sperm counts. So heredity, I think that's our third H now. There are a number of genetic abnormalities associated with male subfertility. Some are 100% if a man has that abnormality, we won't be able to find sperm on him, even with a microsurgical procedure where we actually go into the reproductive tract looking for sperm. So it's important for me to get these studies on men that have extremely low sperm counts. Now, extremely low, some people would put it less than 5 million, and I think that's a relatively good number. It's pretty rare to find a man with a genetic abnormality if his sperm counts are above 5 million. But if they are low, then here are the genes that we can see are responsible for potential male subfertility factor. There's a chromosomal abnormality called Klinefelter syndrome, where a man actually has an extra X chromosome. So he looks just like a guy, walks just like a guy, talks just like a guy, but he has some hormonal abnormalities, as well as having uh, poor development of his testicular tissue, and therefore poor sperm development as well. We can still find sperm on those men, especially if we find them early, and especially if we find them before they start testosterone replacement therapy, which almost all of them need because their testosterone levels are going to be low. Now, if you look at the Y chromosome itself, the Y chromosome itself has a region called the AZF region, which stands for azospermic factor. The AZF region then is subcategorized into an A, B, and a C region. And so when we do molecular analysis of men's chromosomes, so this is a blood test, we look for that, what we call Y microdeletion, because if they're missing one category, one part of one of those chromosomal regions, that may be the reason for their fertility. The worst Y microdeletion to have is an AZFB. So in other words, if that component, and again, these aren't individual genes, these are just regions along the chromosome, but if that B region is missing, if there's a microdeletion there, we have never been able to find sperm on men with that AZFB. So unfortunately, that's one of the few deal breakers. As I said at the beginning of this talk, most of the time we're able to find some way to get a man's uh, sperm count to the point, either through surgery or uh, through natural means, to establish a pregnancy. But an AZFB microdeletion, that, that's the one we just haven't been able to, to uh, figure out yet and fix. There's another not so common, but one certainly that we all learn about in medical school uh, called Kalman syndrome, which is actually what we call a central defect syndrome. So in other words, men with Kalman syndrome have a defect of the midline of essentially their body. And in the pituitary gland, they're not secreting those hormones, uh, especially FSH. They're just not there. And, and they don't have the, the actual material, the, the tissue to secrete it. So the testicle actually never gets the stimulus to make testosterone or to make sperm. And in fact, those men are usually diagnosed late in adolescence when they fail to go through puberty. The nice thing about men with Kalman syndrome is that we can replace those hormones and potentially offer not only testosterone boosting therapies but also uh, sperm production as well. So again, that's not a deal breaker. All right, what about huge and hurt? So 
testosterone replacement, which is becoming a multi-billion dollar industry, and the number of men that I see on testosterone replacement that then come to me for fertility issues keeps escalating over and over, year, year and year again, and it's not going to go away. And this is coming from physicians that prescribe the testosterone replacement, as actually well as, of course, the black market for testosterone and the anabolic steroid users. And essentially what happens is, when a man takes testosterone that his body's not making, his pituitary gland goes to sleep because it's getting the signal that his testosterone levels are so high, he actually doesn't need to make testosterone anymore, so his own production goes down. And hand in hand with that, because it suppresses that FSH as well, sperm producing hormone, his sperm counts go down as well, often to zero. So that's a big thing to remember and a big thing to discuss with your doctor because a lot of these testosterone preparations men look at as supplements and they may not even mention as medication. So when you're filling out your intake sheets when you go to your physician and it says medications and you don't put testosterone therapy, you think of that as a supplement, uh, you have to let your doctor know that, that you're on some sort of testosterone therapy. It's going to change the diagnosis, it's going to change the workup, and ultimately it's going to change your success for the better because testosterone therapy infertility is actually very, very reversible. So for me, I look at the, all those labs to get an idea of, of how much that testosterone replacement may be affecting his sperm counts. What about narcotic use? Now, the incidence of narcotic use in this country is also skyrocketing, and not all of this is through prescription drugs either, and not all the times men are going to tell me that they are taking those medications. I can find out by doing the appropriate blood test to see if they actually are on those medications. I'll check the FSH levels, I'll check their other pituitary hormones, and be able to determine if their narcotic use is actually causing their fertility issues. But essentially, it works the same way. There's nothing wrong with the testicles in this situation. The sperm factory is there. It's just out to lunch uh, or sitting on the couch disabled uh, from the uh, narcotic use. So very important. And, and those guys, their testosterone levels will be so low because of that as well. So, so they'll not only have a sperm production problem, but also testosterone production problem. So what about the obstructive side? So we've done non-obstructive. We've gone through our five H's. Now we're going to move over to the obstructive side. The obstructive side is a little bit more plumbing now, which is truly what most of us do as urologists, is unblock pipes. And in the reproductive tract, there are multiple sources of obstruction, and it's important for me to determine where the obstruction is. Now obviously, or maybe not so obviously, the most common point of obstruction is a vasectomy. So that's exactly what we're doing. Essentially, we don't change anything else in the reproductive tract when a man decides that he wants to have a vasectomy for birth control. All we're doing is basically blocking the highway. So a big part of my practice is to put those back together when a, a man or a couple change their mind. Knowing exactly where the vasectomy was done, I can go in using a microscope and put those two channels back together so that he can have continuity again. We relieve the obstruction and sperm come back. It's not always that straightforward. There are, there are things that men could be born with, either genetic defects or even blockages from cysts, stones, all kinds of things that can cause obstruction elsewhere in the reproductive tract. One of the most common genetic abnormalities in at least uh, a European population is a cystic fibrosis gene. Up to one in 25 men or people are carriers for the cystic fibrosis gene and so the incidence of the disease is a lot less than that. But if a man has at least one copy of that gene, usually it takes two, he may have a, an absence of the vas deferens where basically, again, the sperm production is there, but he's not actually able to get sperm into the ejaculate. I've also seen obstruction from inguinal hernia repairs. So again, if you're a male thinking about fertility and you have a hernia, talk to your surgeon about either if he's going to use mesh take extra caution around the vas deferens so that that area isn't blocked. And then lastly, infections can also cause uh, a problem with fertility. Epididymitis, which is that little tube there we talked about earlier, it can get so gummed up with infection, inflammatory tissue, that all the sperm are blocked at that level as well. Most of the time, we're able to catch epididymitis and treat it with antibiotics. We don't see that. 
But this is certainly something I've seen in my career. So how do I make the diagnosis of obstructive subfertility? With the non-obstructive, again, we go back to blood work and we go back to obviously looking at the semen analysis and our physical exam. So on obstructive subfertility, a man's physical exam should essentially be normal. Now occasionally a man will have some obstruction higher up in the reproductive tract near the prostate or near the seminal vesicles where the semen is made. And I may be able to feel that on a rectal exam. Uh, but for the most part, he should have normal testicles. Maybe I won't be able to feel that vas deferens and that will lead me down the pathway of, of thinking about that cystic fibrosis gene we talked about. Uh, maybe I won't be able to tell anything is wrong at all and we'll have to use some other diagnostic modalities. I use a lot of ultrasound in my practice to look for those uh, areas of obstruction, for example. Now, his semen volume can either be normal, again, think of the vasectomy, where we don't change the, the amount of fluid that comes out during an ejaculation after vasectomy, may be the same in other obstructions where the obstruction is way down low. If it's higher, up near the seminal vesicles in the ejaculatory ducts itself, or from the prostate area, if it's higher, that's where the seminal fluid comes from, so I might find that he has lower seminal fluid. So that's going to be a key indicator on that semen analysis. What about the hormones? Those should all be normal because, again, the FSH up here is only responding to feedback from the sperm, and it gets that feedback through the bloodstream, not through the tract. So the sperm that are there trapped are still sending that signal to the FSH that, hey, factory's good, production numbers are where we need to be. They don't know that the road is closed, and so those numbers are going to be absolutely normal and where they should be. So getting back to the cystic fibrosis, I think it, it helps to discuss that just a little bit more. It is interesting in that the, the obstruction is certainly anatomic, but the defect is genetic. And what I mean by that is a, a cystic fibrosis male will actually have a fully intact reproductive system as he's developing. So the, the problem is not in the development, but what happens is somewhere while he's still in the uterus, he, the fluid that normally gets turned over uh, in the vas deferens, in the epididymis, becomes thick, and the secretions become so thick, it causes that vas deferens to gum up, and that is a signal for that tissue to basically collapse, and eventually, what we say, involute or go away. So, the key to that is that wherever cystic fibrosis affects us, now that is a, mostly we think of as a lung disease, or a gastrointestinal disease, wherever it is, it's a, it's a malformation or malfunction uh, of, of transport of chloride across cell membranes that leads to that junky fluid. So whether it's junky fluid in the lungs that causes pneumonia and all of the lung complications of cystic fibrosis, or whether it's in the pancreas and the small intestinal ducts causing the digestive problems, or in the vas deferens, the gene is the same all over the body. It's just the organ system that's targeted is going to be different in terms of the effects we see. So the other key thing about cystic fibrosis is the number of times I make that diagnosis as a urologist and a male reproductive specialist is far more common than you might think. In other words, a lot of these men don't have any of those serious, serious life-threatening abnormalities in cystic fibrosis that gets that condition picked up much earlier. So they may be in their 30s and have, well, maybe they have a little extra cold symptoms in the winter or they've had pneumonia once or twice but nobody's ever thought to test them for that because they've never been that sick and when I do their exam and find that I, I can't feel that vas deferens I order the genetic testing and sort of recreate our steps to make that diagnosis of congenital absence of the vas deferens and cystic fibrosis. The oldest male I've ever picked up in, with cystic fibrosis in my practice was over 60 years old so again two things to know about cystic fibrosis. One is it can be relatively benign condition, and two, the treatments for men that have severe cystic fibrosis are allowing them to live well into their adult years and really be interested in reproduction, whereas before this was such a devastating condition that most uh, people didn't live through adolescence. So again, great news on the, on the front of cystic fibrosis, our ability to to improve their pulmonary and their lung situation to get them to the point where they can contemplate um, fatherhood and, and parenthood. 
The important thing also about cystic fibrosis is because there's a genetic test for this, whenever I make the diagnosis in a male, it's important for the female partner to also have the genetic testing because they have a much higher chance of having a child with a full-blown cystic fibrosis if both of them test positive for that carrier status. All right, so let's get to the fun of this. The case presentations I'm going to go through are going to illustrate, and I hope, help you determine what you've learned from this presentation so far today. Because we're going to go into all of the different scenarios of obstructive and non-obstructive and maybe mixed, and really come up with what I hope are some good learning points. So first case presentation is a gentleman I took, over, took care of many years ago. He was an offensive lineman, huge buff, just the, the picture of looking like he played a great career on, on Sundays. And he had two kids from a previous marriage, divorced, married uh, a new, very healthy, very athletic woman herself with normal menstrual cycles, uh, never had a child, and they elected to go through with, uh, with having additional kids. He had a vasectomy about 13 years prior to them coming to my office. So their consult with me was for a vasectomy reversal. And again, he said, I'm not taking anything, no medications. Oh, but I am on some workout supplements, doctor. Oh, well, super. Well, let's test that to see what kind of workout supplements you are on. And very robust looking guy, still looking like he could be playing on Sunday today. Athletic, you wouldn't think anything was wrong with him at all, with as good as he looked and as strong as he was. Now, I was a little worried because his testicles were a little on the soft side, it's essentially normal, but, but just not as firm as, as I would like in a guy that I would think should have absolutely normal sperm production. So I got some blood work, which I do on everybody, essentially. Testosterone was 1,600. Now, to give you an idea of a reference, anything over 1,000 is considered high. So some of these workout supplements were probably having testosterone components in them, and they weren't just vitamin B12 shots or, or some other supplement uh, that was benign. And in fact, I confirmed that by looking at his levels of FSH and LH, those pituitary hormones we discussed earlier, and they were undetectable, shut down completely. So very important to me. Now I know, even though the guy didn't know that he was on testosterone, he actually was on testosterone. And it was very important for me because here I had somebody that I was about ready to do a surgery on that I have to now think about him not only as a non-obstructive, or I'm sorry, as an obstructive because of his vasectomy, but a non-obstructive as well because of his, of his testosterone use. So that was huge. I mean, really huge. We had two things going on here, anabolic steroid use plus the vasectomy. Thankfully, we're able to fix this most of the time. In other words, there are treatment protocols, hormone protocols that I employ that can reverse the effects of, of testosterone therapy to help restore normal sperm counts. And they uh, did very well after the reversal within about four or five months, they had a baby girl. So, uh, so everybody goes home happy. All right, let's go to another case. This is a 28-year-old, normal guy, walks off the street. They've been trying for a year to have a kid, normal female, neither of them had ever had children before, and totally unsuccessful. She's had a completely normal evaluation to this point. So his physical exam, again, pretty normal. Normal sized testicles, uh, no medications at all. And he did have varicoceles. So there was something a little bit off on his physical exam. And occasionally with varicoceles, they're not as obvious as the picture we saw earlier. Sometimes the only way to determine a varicocele is for a guy to really bear down when I'm examining him and when he's standing up to see if that blood flow pools down there. And in fact, that's what he had. That's what we call a grade one varicocele. So now he's on to a little bit of something maybe that we could go to help this man. And so the semen analysis came back a normal volume. So a normal volume should be somewhere between two and five milliliters of semen. So right in the middle. We'll make it easy today. I centrifuged the sperm. It's very important to do this. If you get a, sp a sample that has no sperm in it, if you spin that sperm down and really concentrate it to the bottom of your test tube, you may every once in a while find a couple of rare sperm. We call that cryptospermia, and it completely changes your diagnosis and your workup, as well as potentially offering success rates for proceeding with that couple 
uh, usually through assisted reproduction. This poor fellow had nothing, nothing on, on a spun pellet either is what we call it, that centrifuge specimen. So we repeat the semen analysis when we find that. You bring him back at least a few days later. Second semen analysis, same thing in this gentleman. Blood work came back eh, kind of equivocal, right? So his testosterone, anything under 300, we think maybe a little on the low side, especially for a guy that's 28. Those really testosterone levels should be up in the four, five, 600 range at least. And his FSH was normal. It was a little high, but it was still normal. So again, I really don't have much to go on for this guy. He's coming to me, normal physical exam, essentially normal, maybe just a little off physical exam with, with the varicoceles, but essentially a normal lab profile as well. So in a situation like this, uh, we get our genetic testing. So going back to the, that slide a few, uh, a few slides ago, I want to make sure that his karyotype is okay. A karyotype is that chromosomal assessment looking for Klinefelter syndrome or some of the other even more rare chromosomal abnormalities. Stone cold normal. He is a 46 XY male. And there was no abnormalities along that Y chromosome. So again, I got nothing. So normal labs, bilateral varicoceles, that's about all I have to go on at this point. So he's got non-obstructive azospermia. So what do I do with a, a patient like this, and how do I counsel them? So there's a few things you can do, and there's a little bit of debate in the male fertility world about what your next steps are. Essentially, there's two. One is that you say, there's no sperm in the ejaculate, no matter what we do. We can go immediately to in vitro fertilization and perform what's called a microtesticular dissection, or a microtessy, where under a microscope, we're looking through all of that testicular tissue and hoping to find pockets of sperm production that we can use to do uh, in vitro fertilization with the eggs that are harvested from his partner. So that's called a microdissection, microtessy. We can do that, or we can also do what's called a testicular mapping procedure ahead of time. And essentially what that does is it allows both the surgeon and the patient and the couple to explore some options. And so a testicular mapping is a procedure we usually can do under a little bit of sedation in the office, so a little IV Valium or something. And through either tiny incisions or even uh, just by putting uh, nicely placed, and I have to say nicely placed when I follow that with needles into the testicle, nicely placed needles into the testicle uh, in various areas to see if we find pockets where that sperm production is. And then on the day of in vitro and egg retrieval, we can actually use those uh, sperm uh, or go back to that area, if we didn't freeze that sperm, go back to that area and find where that sperm would be again. That's why we call it mapping, because we know exactly where to go on the map if, say, we only found one or two areas that had sperm in the first place. So what this couple elected to do when I discussed to them what varicoceles can do to fertility, and we talked about the heat defects, and we talked about potentially by fixing varicoceles, we might be able to reestablish sperm production, and at the same time, I could perform the mapping procedure and see if I found any sperm so that he would have one anesthetic and we'd have our answer. And so they elected to go through testicular mapping at the time of varicocele repair. So what I found at this time was what we call a maturation arrest pattern. So when a, a normal male cell, a 46XY cell, has to divide into a sperm. It goes through multiple steps to get to that 23X or 23Y cell or sperm in order to, uh, to initiate a pregnancy. Somewhere along that pathway, somewhere along that pathway, you can have a defect that stops the factory production of sperm. And that's called maturation arrest. And really the only known therapy for maturation arrest, if we find that at the time of testicular mapping and biopsy, is a varicocele repair. The odds are still not great, but they're good. Somewhere in the order of about 40% of couples where the male has a varicocele may be able to establish a pregnancy once we repair the varicocele. And, and so in this couple, thankfully, it worked. Obviously, I'm not going to give you one that didn't work, but I've certainly seen those as well. Four months after varicocele repair, we actually found sperm in the ejaculate that they could use for in vitro fertilization and have a healthy child. 
So again, non-obstructive, factory closed, highway open, we were able to do something to change that scenario so that they could have sperm in the ejaculate to go on to assisted reproduction and actually have a biologic child. Let's do one more just for another look at some of the other things we talked about in our earlier discussion. This was a 32-year-old healthy male, no previous children, a 32-year-old female who did have a child from a previous partner. And they'd been attempting intercourse, I'm sorry, attempting pregnancy through intercourse for quite some time without any luck. He has also on his history told me that over the last few months to year, he's noticed that it kind of hurt when he ejaculated. Just a little pain, a little pressure, and felt as if he had some restriction uh, with that. He was otherwise a healthy guy, no medications, physical exam, could still to use a, lose a few pounds. Totally normal testicular exam. On his prostate exam, it was a little tender. I wouldn't call it prostatitis. I didn't feel anything really out of the ordinary that made me suspicious. Now, here's where we go back to the obstruction versus non-obstruction. Semen volume was only 0.4 milliliters. Remember earlier I was saying about 2 milliliters or less would be considered abnormal. So he was very, very low on ejaculate volume, and I didn't see any sperm. Nothing. But all of his other labs were completely normal. His testosterone levels, his pituitary hormones, both the LH and FSH, and all his genetics were normal. I could feel the vas deferens. So again, now I'm thinking, this guy probably has a blockage. It's not down low in the testicle or the epididymis, so it must be up higher. And so to work that up, I do what's called a transrectal ultrasound. Transrectal ultrasound, or truss, allows me to see his prostate gland and his seminal vesicles, what we call the SVs. And I saw that both of those seminal vesicles were ballooned out, very dilated. So I was getting close to realizing that probably the obstruction was at the level of the ejaculatory duct. And so to test that, we do what's called a seminal vesicle aspiration, where essentially, at the time of ultrasound, I stick a tiny catheter, again, I have to say tiny, otherwise a guy wouldn't sign up for this, tiny catheter into those seminal vesicles and aspirate out fluid. And if I see sperm in there, there shouldn't be sperm in a non-obstructed seminal vesicle, or maybe one or two. When I see seminal vesicles that are chock full of sperm, we know then that basically your obstruction is all the way up at the level of the ejaculatory duct. The really gratifying thing about that from both a patient perspective as well as a male fertility perspective, uh, a professional perspective, is we can fix that. And we can fix that with a relatively minor procedure. Still a general anesthetic, but essentially a man comes into the operating room and under that anesthesia I go in with the camera up through the urethra, find where that ejaculatory duct is blocked and open it up. And that's what's called a TU. R-E-D, or a transurethral resection of the ejaculatory duct. By doing that, the minute I did that, boom, highway's open, the road is wide, and couples tend to do very, very well with this procedure. This particular couple was pregnant within two months. So nothing really will get you that kind of turnaround other than an ejaculatory duct obstruction and a resection of those ejaculatory ducts. But you got to look for it. You got to you got to know what to look for and where to look for to make that diagnosis. All right. So here's the big reveal. So remember at the beginning of this discussion today, we were gonna I was gonna tell you what can you do not to get into my office to improve your fertility. That's a, perhaps the only reason that you made it through that entire lecture session. So the big reveal is actually that. It's not much of a big reveal. It's what you've probably been told forever. Change your lifestyle. So whatever's good for the man is also good for his sperm. Don't smoke. We talked about that earlier. Very simple. Don't binge drink. So there are lots of studies out there that the more a man drinks at one setting, the worse his fertility parameters are. And by ceasing that alcohol, sperm counts can improve. So it is reversible up to a certain extent. Lose weight and keep moving. So one of the best things a guy can do is exercise. Remember that whole thing about obesity. So if he can get out and move, 
let those testicles cool off a little bit, uh, let those thighs get a little smaller, a little more toned, then you're going to improve sperm parameters. Plenty of good studies out there to show that weight loss and uh, exercise can improve sperm counts. Keep cool. Goes back to what we were talking about earlier as well. Heat, bad for sperm. So the more you're standing, uh, there have even been studies of scrotal cooling where guys will put ice packs around the testicles. Doesn't sound like much fun, but there you have it a couple of days before a woman's ovulatory cycle to see if they can improve the motility of sperm. So keep cool and don't stress. And the big reveal is that there are no secrets. This is common sense. It's much easier for me to tell you than for you to do, but it's crucial to do everything you can to improve your lifestyle to optimize your chances of fertility. When that doesn't work, come see me. Come see a male re reproductive specialist. Most likely we'll be able to figure out what's going on and help you out. All right, so remember, now we're at the end of our talk, please hashtag some questions on Twitter at hashtag UCLAMDChat, and let's see if we can open this up for some discussion. Thanks very much up to this point. Looks like we may have the iPad coming over here now uh, for some questions. Okay, so the first question, can excessive use of Viagra or such products, there's a, a bunch in that class now, result in male infertility or sexual dysfunction? That's a broad ranging question and, and the, the fundamental easy answer is, is not really. There's actually been a few studies out there on the use of Viagra to improve fertility and really found it was essentially a wash. It didn't really help, didn't really hurt much. Same thing with uh, Viagra is, is sildenafil, generic name. Same thing with Tadalafil, which is the generic name for Cialis. Small studies, not a huge impact. Now, in, the, in terms of the sexual dysfunction, it's an interesting way of phrasing the question because, of course, these are medicines are known to improve erections and therefore improve sexual function. Uh, one of the things that I will riff on on this question is can taking these over time produce a dependence on these medications in order to achieve erections? And the answer is essentially no. They don't work that way. They, they work by blocking an enzyme that causes the breakdown of the hormone called nitric oxide, which causes us to have erections. So they don't work by, uh, it, it's not something that you can develop a tolerance to. It's basically just blocking that enzyme. Having said that, and this is a very common question I get, there are a lot of men that are able to take Viagra or any of those medications for a period of time and then have them become no longer effective. And so they come in and say, those things don't work for me anymore. I, I must have gotten dependent on them. But in fact, if you think about why is a man taking those medications in the first place, it's because he probably has an underlying medical condition. High blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity, all of those things that the Viagra doesn't treat. So essentially it's the disease process that's catching up to that man to the point where there's only so much medication you can take before it becomes less effective because whatever got you in that place in the first place is now worse by however many years it takes to get to that level. What about this? Can sports related trauma to the groin area result in male infertility? The answer is sure. It depends on the sport and it depends on the trauma. So obviously if a man gets a, a huge uh, trauma, say a handlebar injury from a motorcycle or from a BMX accident or something like that, that causes disruption of the testicle, we call a rupture, and it's not repaired, that testicle can suffer severe damage or it could even cause a blockage. It would be very unlikely, but it could block both sides. So in other words, if, if he had a, an injury so significant to the pelvis that both of those reproductive sides were affected, sure, I could see that. One of the other questions I get all the time is, what about bike riding? We hear this all the time. Uh, I shouldn't ride my bike. Uh, it causes fertility issues. And the answer to that is, it really depends on how much you're riding your bicycle. So if you think about a guy that's riding 40 miles a week or a guy that's riding 400 miles a week, that's an extreme difference. So it's not the bicycle riding itself. But we do know that men that are uh, professional cyclists during their high training season, their hormone levels change. Their testosterone actually often drops and they will have abnormalities in sperm production. But again, for the guy that likes to cycle on the weekends to stay in shape, I don't really discourage that. Uh, any sport-related trauma that causes damage to the testicle, however, can certainly cause damage to the reproductive 
system and, and cause potential fertility problems. How many times have I seen that in my practice where an injury causes bilateral blockage or bilateral injury to the testicle so severe that we can't fix it? I would have to say probably zero. So not a huge, huge problem. What about this? Like steroids, can other supplements be detrimental to fertility? So what else is out there in the, in the big, bad, really, truly unregulated world of, of supplements? And the answer is, who knows? Anything that affects testosterone production, anything that affects pituitary metabolism is going to have some effect on male fertility. So it's very difficult for me to counsel patients because you don't know what, what, what they're actually taking. But, but absolutely, there's a lot of things out there that you can buy over the counter and, and much more on the internet that can disrupt fertility. So it's very important when you list your medications that you consider anything you take a medication, supplements, herbs, et cetera, so that we can build a better picture of what may or may not be detrimental to your fertility. Well, I think that's it for uh, the Twitterverse. I really appreciate everybody hanging out with me for the last little bit of time and, and getting through that, uh, that, that initial technical delay. And, uh, and please um, uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks very much.